Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished panelists, colleagues and guests joining us virtually. A, a very warm welcome to this event to commemorate the International Day for the Eradication of Poverty. Today, as we stand amidst unprecedented global challenges, our chair goal is to emphasize the power of quality jobs as a key dimension of well-being in driving inclusive economic growth, reducing inequalities, and empowering people out of poverty. More than three years since the onset of the pandemic, global poverty levels have largely rebounded, but the recovery is uneven. People in nearly 30% of developing economies remain poorer than before the pandemic. If current projections hold, an estimated 7% of the global population will still be living in extreme poverty by the end of this decade. In addition, according to the 2022 Global MPI, 1.2 billion people in 111 developing countries live in acute multidimensional poverty. Jobs are not just a means to income. They shape our identities, our dreams, our aspirations as individuals and societies. Yet, as jobs remain elusive to nearly 500 million people globally, the world needs more jobs, particularly for women and, job and youth. But much more importantly, people need better jobs. And what are better jobs in, in, in the context of this conversation? They are the ones that move people beyond merely surviving towards truly thriving. Better jobs means decent wages, they embody respect, safety, fairness, and opportunity for growth. Yet millions of people endure hazardous working conditions, earn below poverty wages, and face discrimination daily. This is not just an economic challenge, it is a moral one. The global landscape of jobs is in the middle of profound change, driven by both how individuals engage in employment and how economies operate. These include automation, technological developments, demographic transition, the green transition, and an ever-increasing frequency of economic, health, geopolitical, and climate-induced shocks. If appropriately addressed by governments and the broader development community, the, community, the cumulative efforts and effects of the transitions can generate opportunities for all segments of society. Across all countries of different income levels, investments in decent jobs make sense to promote catalytic transformation in all sectors, evidence in our just released SDE Insight reports. And according to these reports, 79 out of 93 countries identify SDG 8 on decent work and economic growth as the key driver to accelerate sustainable development, as shown on the slides. Support for decent jobs needs to be anchored in systemic responses that promote more inclusive, job-rich, greener, and climate-proof growth strategies. In particular, the focus on growth and jobs must be reconciled with decarbonization and a just energy transition. This is amongst the key messages of the UNDP SDG Insight Reports, which highlights examples of countries such as Iraq, which is diversifying its economy by boosting employment opportunities away from fossil fuels to pursue development in a greener, more inclusive manner. South Africa is another example that places emphasis on economic productivity and innovation that can generate jobs and simultaneously support the achievement of the nexus between water, SDG 6, energy, SDG 7, and food, SDG 2. Dear colleagues and friends, jobs are not the sole responsibility of governments. In fact, the bulk of jobs are not created by governments, but by the private sector. However, governments can create an enabling environment to unleash the potential of the private sector for job creation and reach those at the margins of the labor market, ensuring that no one is left behind. Clear policies and partnerships, including public-private initiatives, are essential in creating and promoting jobs that provide decent earnings, have safe working conditions, and safeguard workers' rights. Our event today aims to bring together leading voices from various backgrounds to engage in a meaningful dialogue on advancing the empowerment of people out of poverty through quality and sustainable jobs. 
with multiple transitions at play from technology to green initiatives, our STEAM panel will shed light on how we can ensure a just transition where no one is left behind. UNDP, alongside other UN agencies and partners, is committed to supporting governments as they invest in policies and frameworks that promote the generation of quality jobs. Our commitment is unwavering to put the vision of poverty eradication into action, helping countries to make bold decisions now to realize a better tomorrow. And before we delve into our discussion, let's set the stage with a short video that captures the essence of our theme today. may have seen this video underscores the urgency and the significance of our mission and remind us that behind every statistic, there's a face, a story, a dream waiting to be realized. And with every job created, we have a story of transformation from dependency to self-reliance. We set off benefits for communities and we stimulate economies and drive development from the ground up. So let's now turn our attention to the main event, our panel discussion. Uh, we are very privileged to have today with us Sabina Alkayer. Sabina is Professor of Poverty and Human Development at the University of Oxford and the Director of the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, OFI, at the Oxford Department for International Development. A longtime collaborator with UNDP, highly committed to support countries on how to measure multidimensional poverty, and above all, a dear and close friend. Welcome, Sabina. We also have Mr. Gregory Chen. Gregory is the Managing Director of the Ultra Poor Graduation Initiative at BRAC International. He has over 25 years of experience in poverty reduction and financial inclusion, and brings expertise in service delivering, technical advisory, and government policy reforming. Welcome, Gregory. We also have with us Sofia Spreckman Sinedo. Sofia is the Secretary General of CARE International, a leader in international development and a long serving champion of gender equality. She has been with CARE for more than 25 years, placing women and gender justice at the heart of CARE's work. Welcome, Sofia. We also have with us today Jonathan Richten. Uh, Jonathan is the founder and CEO of Human Future, a global business and technology advisory investment and education firm. 
He is a business leader whose career has spanned both from private and public sectors, formerly serving as Chief Information Officer at the city of Palo Alto, California. Welcome, Jonathan. Ted Chen, uh, Ted is the co-founder co and CEO of Evercom Singapore, one of Asia Pacific's fastest growing sustainability AI companies in the clean tech sector. He has advised the government of Singapore on various industry transformation initiatives, as well as on the ICT framework and data policy with the United Nations. Welcome, Ted. And finally, we have with us Kulekani Mate. Uh, Kulekani is the Deputy Chief Executive Officer at the Business Unit South Africa, BUSA. Prior to joining BUSA in 2013, he was the head of financial inclusion at the Banking Association South Africa, where his portfolio included transformation in the banking industry, small business development, and financial education. Mr. Mati has also served in various public service positions, including his tenure in the National Planning Commission Secretariat. Welcome. Thank you all for joining us today. And with furthermore, uh, let me now invite Sabina, um, to start with our discussion. And Sabina, given your deep knowledge and expertise in supporting the development of the Multidimensional Poverty Index, or the MPI, at uh, the Oxford Policy and, and Human Development Initiative, along with tailored policy measures to identify and address the multiple aspects of poverty and human development across the national and global context, how can we ensure that job opportunities remain inclusive, resilient, and adaptable, especially in lieu of multiple transitions and crises to drive the reduction of multidimensional poverty? Over to you, Sabina. Thank you so much to Michelle and to all who are joining us today. Um, the aspect of work is so vital. I did my doctorate with poor and destitute women in South Asia and it was on income generation activities. And what struck me was that they articulated the value not only of money um, so that they had better food or children's um, expenses, but also the value of work that was meaningful, that gave back to society, that filled them with peace um, and somehow um, carried their skills and potentials forward. And so the first reason that work is a fundamental aspect of poverty is that in addition to bridging the economic exclusion, uh, it has intrinsic value in meaning and self-esteem in developing people's potentials and challenges, and of course, underlying SDG 8. So a multidimensional poverty aspect looks at the links between deprivations and work with those in poor education outcomes for oneself or one's family, um, at poor health opportunities, at challenges in the housing environment or security or social protection. And first, the reason that we do this is that across the world, deprivations reported re related to work and livelihood are valued by poor persons and articulated as inextricably linked to other dimensions of poverty in their lives. And so the bottom-up studies confirm this, and so we want to measure these dimensions. But the Atkinson Commission uh, of the World Bank also recommended that the World Bank and others looking at poverty look not only at nutrition and health, education, living standards, but also at access to work. Um, but data do not permit that at the global level, something I'll come back to. National governments who are looking holistically at the lives of impoverished um, men, women, and children are voting with their feet. And they include a dimension on work or employment with different names in their multidimensional poverty indices that are tailored to the national conditions and definitions of poverty aligned with their national plans, as well as SDGs. And the national MPIs are permanent poverty statistics. And the countries that include work are low, middle, and high income countries. They are from all world regions and they articulate different levels and shapes of work deprivations. But these are evident in Afghanistan, Angola, Armenia, Belize, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Dominican Republic, Ecuador, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Malawi, Mauritania, Nigeria, Palestine, Panama, Paraguay, Philippines, Samoa, Seychelles, South Africa, Uganda, among others. So the first thing is to observe that a critical mass of countries 
feel that work deprivations are interconnected with other deprivations of poverty. They need to be measured and addressed in a concerted fashion. And second, the indicators of poverty vary. So unemployment, underemployment, child work, and informal work are the most common indicators. Whether it's Nigeria and South Africa or Philippines, Guatemala, Mauritania, Belize, South Africa, Armenia, all of them will have some of these indicators. But there are also other aspects of work deprivations countries want to look at. Panama considers workers without adequate pay. Malawi includes work opportunities. And if people are only engaged in farm activities, livestock activities, or casual part-time work, they're deprived. Uganda has something similar. And Costa Rica considers a lack of labor rights. Um, and it also considers people out of the workforce, something Armenia echoes. And a number of countries, Palestine, Afghanistan, Angola, look at the number of dependents. So I think we want to recognize the interconnections between work, poverty, dignity, and the way out of poverty for oneself, one's family, and others, but also emphasize decent jobs that give meaning and uh, cultivate potential. So first of all, that means investing in rural jobs because most of the poor people in most countries are rural livelihoods and technology will come, but they still need um, the, the cultivation activities. How will those jobs improve? And a, a final point is simply on data, that we work in the global MPI. We wanted to include work, empowerment, physical security. We couldn't. The data are not available. But our dream would be in a future world that Tony Atkinson's advice would be taken that demographic and health survey, multiple indicator cluster surveys would have small changes to be able to include some questions on work, decent work, so that we can look at these in a concerted fashion. So I look forward to today, the other participants and you, the listeners, our actions together to address work in a holistic way, focusing on the economic, but also the intrinsic value. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sabina, for stating with such eloquency and clarity, the multidimensionality of poverty, the importance of considering those interlinkages, the importance of data available to effectively inform policy, but also the importance for countries for establishing their own policy priorities in the way they design and adopt these measurements of multidimensional poverty. Thank you so much. Now we're going to move to Gregory Chen. Gregory, welcome once again. Um, in your experience using financial inclusion to advance the lives of people in poverty across the global south, what interventions and financial inclusion measures could you say can help governments, organizations, communities in ensuring pathways to poverty reduction through sustainable jobs and li livelihoods, especially amidst our current global crisis and digital and green transitions? Gregory, the floor is yours. Well, I'm going to build on what Sabina has said and, and maybe take it from Brack's perspective, um, which as, as a practitioner in development and just as background for those of you who don't know us, we are a 50 year old um, development organization that was founded at the time of Bangladesh's independence. When Bangladesh had rates of poverty, roughly four and five people were living in poverty and uh, very happy to say that Bangladesh approaches today middle income status. And so we've lived alongside that journey and seen what's involved um, in, in transforming people's lives. And I, of course, jobs have been a very, very big part of that story in Bangladesh. Um, but there's much more to it and underneath that. And I, I'll start with my, my bottom line, which is I'm not sure that jobs will be enough in the end for us to leave no one behind, that we're gonna to have to actually think of the billion that you spoke about, if we think about those in the most extreme conditions, let's say the bottom half of that, I think we're gonna need quite different strategies to reach those in the most extreme poverty. And jobs and growth alone are vital uh, for a country's well-being and for many people, but it won't be enough for the people in the most extreme forms of poverty. And that's a bit what comes out of Brack's experience in Bangladesh, which is as we were seeing growth take off, jobs were being created. And let me speak to two categories where women 
one category, especially where women started to work, which was in Bangladesh, at least in the ready-made garments business. And if you look today, in fact, more than half of the employees in that business and Bangladesh is among the leaders in the ready-made garments business. There were underlying reasons why those women were available and why you know, the ready-made garments business took off. Some of that was the investment in the basics for those households with, that those women come from. The other category, frankly, is that there's, there's uh, legal migrant labor, mostly men abroad, to the Gulf and other countries, probably 10, 15 countries make up the most of that. They remit huge amounts of money to Bangladesh. These are two of the big drivers that have, have, have dramatically reduced poverty in Bangladesh uh, today. And I should say, you know, BRAC has um, uh, only been a part of that. There's been many, many other things that are happening. Private sector growth being, um, um, Michelle, you had mentioned at the beginning, a big part of that. But investments in the basic human capabilities, by the way, has made some of the taking advantage and seizing these opportunities possible. And also frankly, made them much more valued employees and much more better able to bargain for the kind of rights and privileges as employees that you had mentioned at the very beginning. Um, financial inclusion has been a vital part of that. Um, and it's, it's because finance is a means of taking risks and planning. And in, in seizing opportunities, finance plays an important part. And we have quite a number of, of financial services and financial inclusion work across BRAC in Bangladesh, and we're now in, in 15 other countries. But let me come to the main point as I've got limited time, which is about the extreme poor, which is, um, I think we need to think differently. Even before COVID, we were leaving a large group of people behind. Thus, UN coined the term, leave no one behind. Um, a, a sentiment we very much endorse given our experience in Bangladesh, that even amid the growth, there was a group who was not able to benefit as much from that growth. And so we uh, developed, and others have developed in many other parts of the world, something called the graduation approach. It's one of um, a number of different, what we call big push investments in households living in extreme poverty. And I won't spend time, too much time, but it attacks the multidimensional nature of extreme poverty that Sabina had mentioned at the outset. And it is a time limited investment. So it is not a permanent social protection program. It is a time limited investment in the underlying capabilities and capacities of the individuals in the program and their households uh, that can put them on a permanent pathway out of poverty. Um, we, we champion one such program. Uh, there are many such programs and we think uh, moving ahead to leave no one behind, uh, we really need to double down on these investments. So thanks for the chance to share that with you today. Gregory, thank you so much to you for, for sharing that perspective from a practitioner angle uh, that brings once again, the complexity of effectively reaching out, especially those left further behind. But also I take the, the invitation to keep thinking differently until we reach that ultimate goal. With this, I would like to turn to Sophia Spreckman. Sophia, as a, as a longstanding champion uh, for gender equality in international development and your experience in spread heading women and gender equality at the very heart of CUR International's worldwide work, how can we best address the systemic barriers that limit women, limit women from accessing quality and sustainable jobs? And how can we capitalize in the growing care economy to reduce poverty and inequality? Welcome, Sophia. The floor is yours. No, thank you so much. And, and uh, thank you for the invitation to, to join this um, conversation. Also, for those that don't uh, know care, also on the practitioner side, like Gregory, um, an organization founded um, 75, 76 years ago, actually, and we do both uh, humanitarian response and long-term development, both, uh, and the next was everything in between, of course, um, um, about 50-50 in terms of um, uh, the effort of our work. We are in 111 countries, so, uh, but let me, let me specifically, um, and actually, Gregory, I really want to commend you for the phenomenal work that Bragg does on uh, the poverty graduation program, which in fact we many of us have have really learned from, it's it's um, it's phenomenal. Um, 
on gender and maybe let me a lot has been said already and I don't want to be repetitive but let me stress precisely because that's where my passion lies around uh, gender and 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 of course you know um, the video showed it clearly and all the stats we are seeing uh, by UNDP show it even more clearly that the hard gain wins on, on poverty have um, really been rolled back um, and that inequalities are progressing but I would say especially gender um, inequality uh, has reversed actually by a generation and this in a context of you know all the poly crises of climate um, the ongoing COVID crisis and its consequences rather conflicts as we're currently seeing all around the world in Afghanistan and Gaza and Libya and Syria and Yemen so there's so many horrendous crises happening all at once that it may be actually, it's actually hard to witness, but we need to pay attention in all of this, um, especially to women and girls because they disproportionately are impacted by all of these crises. And it is in our hands to turn that tide, um, investing of course in humanitarian support, in peace building, in gender equality and development results, and women and girls leadership. And um, let me come more to the angle of, of, of jobs and, um, and actually why also women are more disproportionately impacted by these crises, because it is in the structural inequalities that they face, such as the inequity of unpaid care, because as we all know, women and girls perform the majority of paid and unpaid care and domestic work, and the lack of social protection and other safety nets, uh, because also the majority of workers in the informal sector are women. And as we all know, informal work comes without social and legal protection for the most part. So they also were the first to lose their jobs at the onset of the pandemic. And as labor markets recover, they are the last to re-enter those labor markets. The World Economic Forum has warned us that there's an emerging gender crisis in the world of work uh, with wider gender gaps than even measured and ever measured before. So it's really crucial in this context, as we think of the world of work, to address the structural inequalities and to foster gender equality, economic justice, equitable access to decent and quality jobs precisely in this context. So the asks I think that uh, I want to put on the table is to build caring economies in line with the five R's, the five R's, I don't mean the reuse, recycle, no, I mean the recognition, reduction, redistribution, representation and reward for care work. Those are the five R's that I think we need to put in the center of the debate when it comes to women and girls. Because the care work is valuable. Often we talk about the burden of care work, but it adds value to societies and, and economies. And in fact, 65% of women's working hours are spent on unpaid care that isn't captured by GDP and, um, and is really the backbone of societies and economies. In fact, unpaid care work adds 10.8 trillion to the global economy each year, which is 9% of global GDP. So a lot of effort is being done to ensure that women aren't under participating in labor markets, but instead of saying, women aren't are under participating as we often say in the global economy and around jobs one actually should say that the state and men are under participating in care because that's the real issue with which women are faced and you know if women and communities didn't provide for this unpaid care work governance wouldn't be able to underinvest in the care sector in healthcare and education so governments and decision makers really need to invest in 
real alternatives to unpaid care. That is absolutely fun fundamental. Um, and so that, um, you know, and having no money isn't actually an excuse because there already is a cost. It's just not carried by the state, but by women and girls. And that manifests itself in limits to decent and quality jobs for women. And of course, in all of this, it's very important as we design new alternatives that women's leadership, their own ideas are part of designing those systems. And um, if I make, make at the end actually a kind of a, also an economic argument for this, besides of course the issue of rights and the issue of the right of women to, to participate with dignity in the labor market and not to carry this immense burden as we often call it, but we should not, is that by closing, as we all know, closing the employment gaps between women and men could actually yield 20% growth in GDP. So um, that's important as well. And of course I have mentioned um, that this as a human right in itself and um, an issue of dignity and self-realization uh, as, as, um, as was already put on, on the table also um, quite clearly. So thank you for the opportunity to, to share these thoughts. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sophia. And, and, and thank you for making that clear, the point that it would be absolutely impossible to end poverty if we don't address those structural barriers that prevent women and girls to access quality, sustainable jobs and, and addressing in an effective way alternatives for that unpaid care. And, and I take your five R's as, as a thinking framework that can help us uh, leading to, to that point. Thank you once again, Sophia. And now uh, let me please invite Jonathan Rischenthal. Jonathan, um, considering the rapid pace of digitalization and, the, and its transformative impact on various industries, we know that many societies are struggling with a growing digital divide, leaving many, particularly those living in poverty and the most vulnerable behind. How can we ensure that digital transformation becomes an inclusive process that equips individuals, societies, and cities with the necessary skills and opportunities to thrive in a digital economy? Welcome, Jonathan, the floor is yours. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, uh, Michelle. It's a real pleasure to be part of this uh, event today. And while it is a, a day for the eradication of poverty, it's a reminder that the eradication of poverty is a year-round activity, an everyday uh, activity. Um, uh, I'm delighted to, to be here to talk specifically about digitalization and what can be done uh, in that regard. Um, it's kind of interesting that uh, we've reached, in fact, an incredible milestone. Today, 5 billion people have access to the internet out of a population of 8 billion. And if you're an optimist like me, that's actually an amazing a number, but it still means that about 40% of the world doesn't have access uh, to the internet. So my primary point here, underlining everything I'm gonna talk about is uh, countries and cities have to focus on digital uh, infrastructure. Um, you've gotta have uh, internet to, uh, access to the internet. That, that is, I would argue, probably uh, becoming a human right. Um, and from that, if you have access, even uh, if it isn't super fast, like we have here in, in California and San Francisco, where I am, um, access of any type to the internet is definitely a, a game changer. And if you look for, if you look at where we're at, we're adding about 500,000 people to the internet uh, every single day. Uh, so the momentum is, is good. The direction is, is certainly good. Um, and the, we, we know now the data is really clear that connection to the internet, the digitalization uh, of, of industries and new industries created from digitalization uh, actually has been generally a, a positive story. Um, and, and by 2030, where we're, we're headed quite quickly uh, and beyond, uh, we, we believe 30% of the global economy, the 30% of GDP will be the digital uh, uh, economy. Um, and, uh, and and creating uh, actually tens of millions uh, of of new jobs. Uh, so so it is largely a good news story. The, the key thing though is once you have the infrastructure in place, you've got to have the education, right? People have to know how to use uh, the tools and how to access resources when they do have 
uh, access uh, to the internet. Now, because the internet is global and uh, you can connect to it through uh, all sorts of devices, it means that more people than ever can access education. And I think that's the next layer on top of the digital infrastructure that societies must push forward with. Um, you know, today, um, more than ever before, it's quite remarkable uh, how many amazing educational resources are available to everybody who has just a simple connection to the internet. A major universities such as MIT, Harvard, and Oxford, uh, and others make many courses available free to everybody with no burden, no cost whatsoever. Um, so think about that. If we can tap into that, uh, we can bring the most remarkable education to uh, more and more people uh, every, every single day. Um, where communities can't provide internet access to large numbers of people quick enough, uh, cities and, and uh, communities uh, can provide and, and are providing um, central locations like in their libraries and in community centers access uh, to the internet. Um, now, the next thing on top of this is, well, okay, so you've got an internet, sorry, digital infrastructure, you have access to education. Uh, another positive, the digital revolution, this fourth industrial revolution that we find ourselves in is distant doesn't matter anymore. Um, you know, it used to be location, location, location. You had to be in a place to get the best jobs. You have to move to those places. And that limited the ability for uh, people in all types of the world to, um, to access great, great opportunities. And today uh, we know that distance is less of, of a burden. Um, if you have access to the internet and you have some skills, you can provide um, uh, services and you can, you can have a good job from uh, just about anywhere in, in the world. I'll, uh, my quick story on this, by the way, uh, I've written uh, many books, as, as some of you know. And uh, for one of my books, uh, we found an artist uh, to design the cover um, in, in Pakistan um, uh, in, a, in a very low income area. And he did a beautiful job. Uh, that just wouldn't have been possible uh, a few, uh, barely 10, 15, 20 years ago, perhaps, uh, where a person like that who did learn some great um, uh, you know, graphic skills was able to find me. We were able to find him. He was able to do the work, send it to us, and then we were able to pay him uh, digitally too uh, to do the work. So that that we see repeated uh, over uh, and over again. Um, uh, just recognizing that I uh, my time here, uh, the, the last point I just wanted to make uh, because, of course, like all our topics, these are huge topics, is um, digitalization is enabling a new era of financial tools. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, two and a half billion people are unbanked. They don't have bank accounts. They don't have access to uh, banking systems. Um, and for a whole variety of reasons, which may come up in this, in this discussion. However, uh, these new fintech digital tools uh, can access people and enable um, many of those unbanked to gradually become part of uh, some financial resources so they can have access to money, to loans, where they can build businesses, create new uh, opportunities. Uh, I have a lot more to say, but I'll, I'll pause there and, and thank you again for the opportunity. Jonathan, thank you so much to you um, for, for highlighting, you know, like the importance of infrastructure access, but that special emphasis that you put on education, particularly on these ever-changing contexts in which, as you said, distance doesn't seem to matter anymore. Uh, but I, I end with your initial remark that ending poverty must be a shared year-round priority. And, and I think this is ex exactly where we want, want to lead after this discussion. Thank you so much. Now, I would like to invite Ted, Chen, Ted, welcome. Given your significant involvement in shaping sustainable ICT frameworks and data policies, how do you see the role of policy in ensuring that technology adoption doesn't exacerbate social inequalities, but rather promotes green entrepreneurship and inclusive growth? And what recommendations can you give for developing countries to harness the potential of their young populations, ensuring they are both educated in and benefiting from the rise in the clean tech job opportunities. Welcome, Ted. The floor is yours. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I'm I, I'm here to to really share about what I've been experiencing in in this region, mostly Asia Pacific, Southeast Asia, and and how youth can play a role in that. So technology 
by its nature is really a double-edged sword. Um, and then the role of uh, policy in terms of guiding and, and how these technologies should be adopted is, is really pivotal. And when we talk about technology adoptions, um, we really cannot ignore the youth out of the topic because usually these youth are the native um, 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 technologies and they're very familiar with technology. These are something that they're, they're, they're very much used to. And the most central point that, that I see in, in this region is prior to any technology adoptions, um, it's really important for the, the, the countries and, and for the cities and, and communities to really first have a good take and, and good understanding of what are the problems that they're trying to solve. Because one of the issues is we have technology everywhere. And there are many cases that we see, you know, um, immediately people tend to jump into solutions. You know, I have solutions for this, I have solutions for that. Um, but is this, is, are those solutions really are going to solve the problem that these communities or, or these um, um, places need or, or not? That, that's one of the most essential questions that, 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 that we see. And one of the good rule of thumb for that is when you're, pitching for technology solution, um, if you ask why enough, three times, four times, five times, you will really get to the bottom of it to see whether this is really making sense or this is really solving the problem that you intended to solve. So, so from a point of technology adoption, really drilling down into what problem are you solving, um, that can really help in terms of shaping or has a better understanding, you know, you know, what technology will fit there. Because in terms of technology, we do have access to technology, we do have all these, but the challenge is which technology you adopt that will make sense for that particular scenario environment that becomes key. And on the topic of youth engagement, I think this is where we really need to leverage on um, youth um, to, to help in these um, scenarios. And I can give you two examples, um, even during COVID that we see in, in this part of the world. So for example, um, we do see youth um, helping youth um, being one of the big trends in, in, in this region. So some of, the some of these youth are leveraging on technology and also, you know, um, spirit of entrepreneurship, you know, really solving on problems like properties and so on. So one of the youth that I've encountered recently, um, just by himself, um, he saw there are homeless um, people um, during COVID started to pile up in his grassroots community. And from there, what he have done is, you know, he worked with the community um, leaders and he worked with the different uh, people in, in the stakeholder in the community and set up temporary shelters for from 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 a certain places where they're not going to solve homeless homelessness but what they can do is provide a intermediate places for these homeless people um, to to get ready and get prepared and slowly help them transition back into workforces and and these are initiative undertake by undergraduates you know who are much younger um, but are already in the position to help you know 50 to 100 um, homeless people slowly transitional um, transitioning into uh, transitioning back into the workforce. And the other one is that we see some of the youth, they see their counterpart um, who are from low income family unable to keep up with educations, you know, because in many parts of the world, you know, tutor is a, is a, is a luxury. So what they have done is they, they go around and they be able to, you know, mobilize 100 or 200 other youth member who are happy to give these kind of uh, uh, tuitions um, to these underprivileged families. And in using simple technology, like, like what we're using now, Zoom and so on, or even host community um, tutoring session. And again, you know, uh, one single youth, you know, in, in, in below, below 20, be able to mobilize 100 to 200 other youth to be able to provide these kind of uh, support to, to their counterpart um, from the low-income family. These really shows that um, youth really have a, have a way to navigate through these. But the challenges that we see with these youth is that um, many of them are able to get to helping 50 to 100 people, but how to help them scale above that, you know, to thousands of people, um, that continues to remain a, a challenge. And, and we don't have an answer for that as well. So this is something that we're right now um, working with uh, um, universities or associations around the world to see you know, how can we equip these youth and, and more importantly, asking these youth, what help do they need in order to scale their initiative to the next level? Um, because we know that entrepreneurship is hard enough and these youth are actually tackling social entrepreneurship. And some of these problems are even governments are struggling with, right? So, so it's really important to see um, what kind of support and what kind of help do, do they really need and to be able to align these support to these youth um, so that they can be the forefront in terms of leveraging on technology, showcase how technology can be used um, to solve their grassroots challenges. Because I think 
from a use standpoint, um, they really have an advantage. One, they're very much familiar with technology. Two, they know their grassroots best because that's where they, they, they grew up on. And, and most importantly, they're really passionate about the people in their grassroots and community. So equipment, uh, equip them with the skill set and resources um, will really um, be, be what we have been preaching for and how we can help help highlight some of these youth leader to, to be able to mobile, uh, mobilize more resources um, to address these issues in their grassroots. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ted, and, and, and thank you for bringing some sort of sense of hope in this discussion, although we don't have the final answers. And, and something that you mentioned that seems obvious, but it's not that obvious, is taking the time to understand the problem before jumping into solutions and how this must be at the heart of any poverty reduction and job creation policy, as it should be the participation of youth throughout the whole policy cycle. So thank you for that, Ted. And last but not least, let me invite Kulekani Mati. Kulekani, as we know, 90% of jobs in de developing countries are created by the private sector. How can the government utilize public-private partnerships to generate quality, decent jobs? And what legislative changes and policy frameworks do you recommend to promote private sector efforts to achieve decent work outcomes? Welcome, Kulekani and the floor is yours. Thank you, Michelle, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody, wherever you are in the world. It is a pleasure to be part of this uh, discussion. So just by way of context, uh, Michelle, South Africa has one of the worst unemployment problems in the world, about 30, 32.6% of able-bodied and willing to work South Africans are unemployed. If you include those that are uh, discouraged, that number moves to 42.1%. Problem is particularly acute amongst young people where 60.7% of those aged 15 to 24 are unemployed and 40% of those uh, between 25 and 34 are unemployed. So that is the extent of the challenge of unemployment in South Africa. If you ask me, that is probably the biggest challenge that we face um, as a country. Every year, about a million young people enter the labor market, but of those, about 60% remain outside of employment education or training opportunities for extended periods. The labor market or formerly formal economy uh, only absorbs about 20% of those. And the challenge is how do we increase um, uh, the, the job growth so that we can bring more young people into, into employment. And we believe this can be done by prioritizing demand-led skilling and creating an enabling environment for young people. And some of the sectors where um, certainly in South Africa, uh, young people can easily access jobs with the right support and the, the, the um, skilling is around digital, global business services and tourism. Collaboration and partnership between government can enable young people to access opportunities in these areas. And what we are currently doing, by way of example, is that the business and government in South Africa have agreed to partner on three initiatives, which are not directly related to jobs, but uh, are in an indirect way in certain instances. So one of those initiatives relates to addressing the shortage of energy supply in South Africa. Those who are familiar with our situation is that we have a serious energy shortage that is affecting uh, growth. And obviously small businesses are particularly affected and their ability to create jobs is therefore curtailed. The second area or the second initiative relates to addressing the bottlenecks around the transport and logistics system, which um, is cloaking uh, our trade, uh, you know, Many of the exporters are losing significant amount of revenues because they can't get their products out to the market. 
Uh, and this, of course, has serious consequences for, for existing jobs, as well as uh, a creation of new jobs. The third area is a joint initiative between government and business to fight uh, crime and corruption. Crime and corruption affect businesses directly, but it also affects citizens in the sense that it curtails their ability to lead full lives. And therefore, we, 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 we identified these three as priorities that we need to work on, in particular because we recognize that a country like South Africa that has such an acute unemployment problem just cannot stand by while existing jobs are being threatened. And so to support job creation, clearly there's a need to uh, make it easy for businesses to create jobs whether they are small or big businesses, in other words, to remove the red tape, and also to provide um, catalytic funding and support for those initiatives that are promising to create a significant number of jobs. I mean, the evidence in our country is clear in that the success of the global business services sector um, was able to provide thousands of jobs to young people despite the economic condition. And this was achieved uh, in uh, the various sectors of society, business and government in particular, working together. The other problem that exacerbates our unemployment issue is the size of our informal sector. So the percentage share of workers in the informal sector in South Africa is roughly 16% compared to 45% um, uh, as an average for middle-income countries. The formal sector only accounts for 69% of total employment. So clearly there is a gap. Um, the, the, the many countries uh, have an informal sector that is able to make up for what the formal sector is unable to do. Some of the steps that we believe can be taken to promote uh, decent jobs and, and uh, through public and private partnership is about investing in, in the right kinds of infrastructure projects which attract private sector investment because they can create uh, job opportunities, as well as to offer targeted support and incentives, uh, tax benefits and grants for industries that have job creation uh, potential. It could, for instance, include uh, incentives to large corporations that are able to bring back roles that are currently uh, being offshore, in other words, uh, to other, other, other jurisdictions. Collaboration with the private sector to uh, develop vocational training that better meets the needs of industry to be able to equip uh, workers or young people with skills that, that, that enable them to access job opportunities making sure that we have stability in the regulatory environment and in the trade, uh, uh, trade agreements that you have, facilitating greater dialogue between government and the private sector, as well as unions is absolutely important in ensuring the fostering collaboration and identifying those barriers to job creation that need to be um, addressed. And just in closing, some of the legislative and policy recommendations that we would make is that given the small size of our both informal, but as well as the small, medium and micro enterprise sector, is that we need to access, strengthen access to finance for small uh, and medium enterprises through a wide range of instruments, possibly including loan guarantee programs and schemes, as well as other uh, measures aimed at increasing access to finance, but also promoting international trade and expanding market opportunities for businesses to be able to uh, 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 stimulate job creation. Entrepreneurship is absolutely critical, but providing, um, supporting our entrepreneurship and uh, providing support to entrepreneurs, simplifying business processes, registration, and, and various other things and ensuring and encouraging businesses to conduct business um, in a responsible way through regulation and incentive for fair wages, safe working conditions, and environmental sustainability. We believe that government working together with business can create opportunities to really begin to tackle 
the challenge of unemployment that South Africa faces. Let me leave it at that. Thank you very much, uh, Michelle. Thank to you, Kulekani, for, for those very concrete and specific recommendations to bring public and private sector together. As we said at the opening of this event, this is not a task exclusive for governments, and, and we need that collaboration uh, in, in the creation of quality, decent works. And, and I also highlight the importance that you gave to taking small businesses, entrepreneurship, informality into, into account, and this link between young people and digitalization that emerged throughout the discussion today as, a, as an important catalyzer of this transformation that we are pursuing. So with this, we are getting close to the conclusion of this panel discussion, although I'm pretty sure we all could stay longer. Um, and to close, I would like to invite each panelist to reflect on one same question in, in just two minutes. And it's inviting you to kindly share your final thoughts and recommendations of what interventions are necessary to ensure that digital and green transitions can generate opportunities for all segments of society. And for this, I'll reverse the order. So we will start with you, Kulekani. Um, so the floor is yours again. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Michelle. Sorry, I was uh, trying to unmute myself. Um, some of the uh, opportunities um, uh, to, to ensure that opportunities fall in the digital and green transitions uh, are, 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 can be taken up, we suggest a couple of interventions. On the one hand, and this is in South Africa, there is a question of accessibility. So we need to provide affordable digital infrastructure and in internet access, uh, skills development, making sure that we offer training programs for digital and green skills, inclusive education, which incorporates digital and environmental literacy into curricula and schools, reskilling and upskilling of workers to support workers uh, in transitioning to digital and green uh, jobs, and also providing assistance uh, for digital and green startups and establishing uh, support systems for workers who are affected by these conditions would be uh, our suggestion. Uh, thanks, Michelle. Thank you so much. Ted, you have the floor. Yeah, I think when it comes to digital, digital and green transition, uh, collaboration is key, right? Um, we, we see that youth are collaborating with youth to help their communities, but more importantly, we also need youth to work with the uh, private sector leaders, public sector leaders. And more importantly, we even need collaboration at the country level. So things like South-South uh, collaboration between developing country working with each other. But when it comes to green transition, uh, many of the technology are considered deep, deep tech and a lot of investment needs to be made before that. So we also need um, triangular collaboration where developed countries can step in and share their experience and knowledge and even resources um, so that the developing country don't have to go through that process again to, to make it more efficient. So I would say that collaboration is definitely key um, um, in this whole regards. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Jonathan. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm not going to repeat anything, but I'm going to add a couple of additional thoughts. Um, the, uh, the, the focus here, I believe, uh, needs to be on uh, connectivity and, and the digital infrastructure. That now provides a platform for government and all sorts of stakeholders to provide advice and guidance to budding entrepreneurs who want to participate in the global economy. Um, and I think my final point is, <clears throat> and I say this a lot as I speak to communities all over the world, is uh, there's no monopoly anymore on ideas. All right. It doesn't matter where you are. You can uh, you, you can be the center of the revolution in quantum computing that's coming um, or, or AI. Um, so uh, local markets uh, can be developed where they don't uh, already exist. And the, and the facts are uh, a market is the most proven way that you bring people out of uh, poverty is to create robust new markets. And I would encourage our communities, our cities, our governments uh, to put additional emphasis on the digital economy, which is going to explode in a positive way over the next few years. Thank you, Jonathan. Sophia. No, oh, thank you, and thank you for um, all all the ideas shared. Really, and and I'm trying to see where they all connect. Um, but maybe let me emphasize uh, one important point from the perspective, of course, of uh, 
the world of work and jobs for women and, and the care economy. Um, and again, you know, this, this care work that is performed often invisibly in an undervalued way um, so that families and societies do not crumble. None of this work that we're talking about, the digital and beyond wouldn't be possible without that care work. And I was thinking, as we think also of a green transition, that there's actually nothing greener and more low carbon than caring for other people. And that, that this should be counted as green work, as if the care work is counted as part of the green economy, this will actually help investments and ambition to increase in both areas around the care economy and green jobs. So again, you know, maybe bringing in this notion of broadening the definition of green work to encompass sustainable and low carbon sectors that are dominated by women, such as care and social work. So um, if we really manage to foster a gender just green transition, um, that is both actually essential and smart, this can actually lead to triple wins for people, uh, for people, for economies and the planet because climate action with a gender lens will increase women's economic justice, which is urgently needed to counter the gender crisis in the world of work, which we I was mentioning earlier. Decreasing gender gaps in employment alone can significantly stimulate economic growth. And as I mentioned earlier, increase global wealth by 160 trillion, which in turn is urgently needed to recover from the compounded economic impacts of our current crisis. So if we invest in sustainable green jobs, such as low carbon jobs and care work, this will benefit societies, economies, the planet, and help us get back on track towards an inclusive, feminist, sustainable, and climate smart future. Thank you so much, Sophia. Uh, now we move to Gregory. Yeah, so there's a lot in your question, um, and I'll be short. Um, I mean, clearly we are, the old mode of growth alone is, is not going to make it happen. We are in a different era. And I think the comments from Ted and Jonathan and others before have suggested we're moving into something quite different. The digital, let me, let me as a practitioner, let me comment on two things on the digital side. One is, and there's a lot of work happening, but much more needs to happen, which is on moving money over distance digital payments. We see huge demand among poor people and across the population for these services all over the world, and we use them extensively. So more of that on, on sort of fair terms. The second is, and we might get uncomfortable with this, but it's a bit of the transition in jobs, is gig work, platform-based work. There is much more of an opportunity, not traditional jobs, right? Um, some of this might even be care work, as Sophia has mentioned. There is a huge opportunity and a challenge around platform gig-based work across all the economies that we work in, uh, especially in poor economies. Um, and I, 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 um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention then the green transition. And most of this, at least in the countries where we, where we see, is about people's underlying livelihoods having to change fundamentally as a result of the, the, the changes being driven by climate. And just a quick statistic on that, in Bangladesh, we have approximately 2,000 new people show up every day in the capital, Bangladesh, um, from their uh, lives being affected out in rural areas, specifically by climate change. So what do those people do? Where do they go? I think digital, um, I think um, new kinds of jobs is, is something, and there's something we have to do there. Thank you so much, Gregory. And finally, Sabina. Thank you so much. The others have said, uh, said it all. If it comes to data, we cannot, for, for example, a global multidimensional measure include internet access. And we don't have it uh, at scale. But beyond that, we don't know who in the household has access or the speed or the device um, very reliably. And you can't tell that necessarily from cell towers can tell the demand but or the supply, but not exactly the intra-household dynamics. And so I think regular, regularly updated data would be very, very useful. Um, because we imagine people in offices 
with laptops and fast internet connections, but as we all know, it's creaky slow, um, it's spotty, and it's expensive. And taking this into account, I think, in a numerical way would help us. Second and third are faster. One is be realistic about people who are going to be left out, older persons, the Ill illiterate or semi-literate persons with disabilities. But the chance of voice-enabled technologies to reach out and leapfrog is one really worth considering, but beyond the major languages. Um, so there's a number of challenges, but that is certainly an area which could be transformative, especially for people who could then do gig work from those devices. But I think the last I haven't heard as much, and it's to be realistic about first-time users, including women, who are affronted by false news or manipulated by it, or who open their bank account for the first time and are victims of a scam. And we might imagine that there is insurance that protects them, but there may not be such. And so to encourage first-time users to enter, one also has to protect them from the negatives. And I think that is perhaps an area where in the digital literature and development, we sometimes overlook them, but we, I see them very concretely in, in lives that are sort of dismayed by how they have entered the, this age. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sabina, and thank you to all panelists. I would think after today's discussion, we all agree that the catalytic role of jobs in driving inclusive economic growth cannot be overstated, and there's a lot much work to do behind this. Um, today, we, we heard from our panelists on key interventions that can support countries during key transitions, namely digital green demographic, to create better jobs that work for people and for the planet. I would like to express on behalf of UNDP a heartfelt thank to your remarkable panelists uh, for the invaluable contributions and insights. And as we depart today, let's carry forward the momentum, bearing in mind that eradication of poverty is not a distant dream, but a tangible reality within our grasp. This International Day for the Eradication of Poverty, let's reaffirm our commitment all year long to create quality jobs, to ensure that growth occurs within planetary boundaries, to strengthen social protection, to build a world where every person can thrive. And with this, I just want to express my deepest gratitude to the panelists and to all of you that join us this morning, this afternoon, depending on where you are, and wish you a great rest of your day. Thank you so much.